Um, okay, I would like to welcome everybody this morning to our Claim Our Prophetic Voice series uh, in the Greater Pacific Northwest USA Mission Center. Last fall for our Mission Center conference that we had online, that was our theme for the conference. And uh, we do a lot of work um, when it comes to preparing for our theme for Mission Center conference every year. Uh, GPW does, puts in a lot of thought and um, uh, into the process and providing scriptural foundation. And so we, um, oftentimes, uh, we get it either from a hymn or from the scriptures. Um, this one, this theme this year, um, is just, I think it's one that Ashley came up with, if I remember correctly. But uh, anyways, we have uh, developed, we decided we wanted to go deeper with the theme throughout the year. I think we're going to start doing that in the future, too. The idea is that we put all this time into this annual conference with a theme that we might as well spend time beyond the conference also exploring it um, as we cast a vision for the year at Mission Center Conference as well. So this is our second uh, workshop in the series. We had one that Ashley Whittem was the leader of back in, uh, that she facilitated back at the end of February. Here we are with our second one with Ron Her uh, Harmon, Heron. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just gotta, you know, that's my new nickname for you, <laughs> Rod Herod, Apostle Herod. Okay, um, anyways, and then uh, Larry McGuire will also be joining us as well. Uh, he's a busy man this uh, weekend with several things going on. And then um, we'll be having our next series. We'll actually be our resuming, our online reunion in July. Uh, will be the third part of our uh, Prophetic uh, Voices series. And then the first weekend of October will be our last one. Um, and more information will come out about those in the uh, future. But that's uh, what we're doing. That's what this is a part of. We also look forward to welcoming Ron and Larry tomorrow as part of our Community Connections Worship at 1045 a.m. Pacific time in the morning uh, for Pentecost Sunday as well. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Ron and uh, Larry as well when he gets here to begin. Go ahead, Ron. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Sean. And it's uh, really good to see all your faces today. I, I really want to just spend time getting caught up on how you're all doing and hearing about what's going on in your lives, um, because that's that's what we do in Community of Christ. Uh, that's part of the heart of what it means to be part of Christian community. So it's, it's good uh, to see each of you here today. Glad that uh, you've made the time to be with us. And we are a more complete community uh, when you are with us. So thanks for being here. I want to welcome you uh, in the grace and the peace of Jesus Christ. Uh, a peace that's not just a calming peace, but a peace that is also a disruptive peace that calls us uh, together and invites us into God's unfolding future, which is a little bit about what we'll be exploring today as we think about not just claiming, but exercising our prophetic voice uh, as disciples and as faith communities. Um, we're going to have a couple things we're going to do today. There'll be several opportunities for you uh, to engage uh, in the conversation along with us. So just want to prepare you um, for that. You may remember back in 2007, uh, this word emerged in our vocabulary in Community of Christ in 2007 called Signal Communities of Justice and Peace. And that was an important phrase for us and is an important phrase for us as we consider how our prophetic voice is expressed every day as disciples and faith communities. Section 164 then kind of took us another step forward and expanded on that where we find these words through the gospel of Christ, a new community of tolerance, reconciliation, unity, and diversity, and love is being born as a visible sign of the coming reign of God. So that's suggesting to us that we are part of these communities that are 
in the now and also not quite yet <laughs> that is still emerging. So we're going to explore a little bit today what it looks like to be countercultural expressions of God's preferred future as individuals and communities of prophetic vision and action. We'll suggest some resources. Uh, we'll point you to some handouts uh, that we have provided that hopefully will help you a little bit in your own study and application of this really uh, important topic that's at the heart of the restoration movement, that's at the heart of Community of Christ. Because I don't know about you, but I am here because of the disruptive nature of God that interrupted my life, my status quo, with the idea, this transforming idea, that I am loved completely and unconditionally. Now, a lot of us are kind of used to hearing that. So, you know, that doesn't sound like necessarily a revolutionary thing. But boy, it sure is to a lot of people out there that have never encountered that prophetic and disruptive truth. The nature of God is sending and transforming love at its core is prophetic and it's disruptive to a world characterized by scarcity and division and fear. Our vision of what could be compels us to be a people of prophetic vision and action so how do we do that? Well, let's start by uh, watching a hymn that's going to ground us in God's prophetic yearnings for justice and peace. I love this hymn, and I hope that uh, you will enjoy it as much as I can and feel the energy and the prophetic vision in this hymn. If I can, get, if I can do it properly. Us. 
Well, I see that my co-conspirator in the gospel, Larry McGuire, has joined us. So we are glad to have uh, Larry with us today. And we are going to let that song be our opening prayer as we continue our journey exploring what it looks like to claim our prophetic voice and exercise our prophetic voice in the world today. So, Larry, I am going to turn things over to you. Thank you. Everybody hear me okay? Yeah, good. Well, I, as you probably some of you saw, I was singing right along with that hymn. Um, the tune, Abide With Me, became one of my favorite hymn tunes when I lived in England. Uh, almost every worship service in which I was involved, uh, Abide With Me, showed up somewhere. So when I heard that hymn, I was instantly hooked because not is it great words, but it's got a great bass part. So I love to sing that as part of Abide With Me. Grateful. Uh, to be able to be here with you uh, today. Sorry, I was a, a few minutes late connecting, um, but I'm really looking forward to this opportunity to share. We're going to turn uh, toward a passage of scripture that um, has been very meaningful in um, much of the work that Ron and I and others have been engaged in as we've been thinking about not just kind of pondering what does it mean to have a prophetic voice and to live as as people who are called to be able to share God's vision for this peaceable time of life, but actually what does it mean to actually do it? It's nice to ponder it and reflect on it, but the call is also then to engage, to live it out. And this has been a text that we have wrestled with and uh, continues to kind of give us uh, some insights. So um, we're going to look at Isaiah 58. And just before we actually engage in the conversation, I want to just provide just a little bit of a background of, of this particular text. Uh, the historical setting for Isaiah 58 is found kind of in the second um, period of the writer of Isaiah 56 through 66, and it's technically a time of the return uh, to Jerusalem from, from exile in Babylon. And what does it look like to have everything kind of destroyed and be in, in exile and isolation and then come back into your home area and everything is is changed it's also what does it look like uh to have things be called to be restored in the midst of the destruction that's going on things did not work out the way they had originally intended and now they find themselves in a period of what does it look like now to make sense and rebuild Isaiah 58 traditionally deals with two particular areas of conversation, and that is fasting and Sabbath, uh, how to observe those. And it highlights this reality that today we would call a liminal space, that in-between space that we find so much of our life in. It is the space of the now and the not yet, the space of what is really going on now, but then what are we being pushed into to cross into that unknown space? And that's much of what the gospel story was about, was the disciples experiencing that in-between space of, this is the reality right now of Jesus' teaching, or this is the reality right now of Jesus' death, but we're being pushed into the unknown and the not yet, and what does that look like? for us. And there you will notice in some of this language there is this notion of if then. And that's kind of a problematic area for biblical scholars to be able to wrestle with. And it looks at the individual disciple but then it shifts into the community and there's this transition that takes place and we often find ourselves in that kind of a attention. If if we're doing these things, these are the things then that should occur. And what does that look like for us today? The spiritual disciplines of fasting 
uh, prayer, gathering together for worship are really important for our time as well as for the time of the passage. But there is a clear connection here in this particular context between practicing the spiritual disciplines and living them out in a way that leads to acts of compassion and justice and service. And so I want to make a shift to, to take a look at this passage with you, just a snapshot of an understanding of, of Isaiah 58 and see kind of what is it about this passage that guides us in the conversation for the rest of the day. So if you have um, printed it off or if you have access on the screen uh, that maybe you were able to download, let's look at Isaiah 58 from the message uh, version of of uh, of this, and I'll read through it, and then we'll pause, and and reflect on the question: Is there a place where your your mind, your attention, your focus has been calling you to go? And then, what is disruptive to you in this text? And we'll be sharing together in some small groups after this particular passage has been read, and we'll we'll take some time to talk together in, uh, in breakout rooms around this text. You fast, but at the same time you bicker and fight. You fast, but you swing a mean fist. The kind of fasting you do won't get your prayers off the ground. Do you think this is the kind of fast day I'm after? A day to show off humility? to put on a pious long face and parade around solemnly in black? Do you call that fasting a fast day that I, God, would like? This is the kind of fast day I'm after, to break the chains of injustice, get rid of exploitation in the workplace, free the oppressed, cancel debts. What I'm interested in seeing you do is this, sharing your food with the hungry, inviting the hung homeless poor into your homes, putting clothes on the shivering ill-clad, being available to your own families. Do this and the lights will turn on and your lives will turn around at once. Your righteousness will pave your way. The God of glory will secure your passage. Then when you pray, God will answer. You'll call out for help, and I'll say, here I am. A full life in the emptiest of places, if you get rid of unfair practices, quit blaming victims, quit gossiping about other people's sins. If you are generous with the hungry and start giving yourselves to the down and out, your lives will begin to glow in the darkness. Your shadowed lives will be bathed in sunlight. I will always show you where to go. I'll give you a full life in the emptiest of places, firm muscles, strong bones. You'll be like a well-watered garden, a gurgling spring that never runs dry. You'll use the old rubble of past lives to build anew. Rebuild the foundations from out of your past. You'll be known as those who can fix anything, restore old ruins, rebuild and renovate, make the community livable again. So, Sean, if you wouldn't mind giving us some time for the breakout rooms, I believe we will have uh, about uh, 15 minutes that we can share in the, in the breakout rooms. And just to have conversation around these two questions, was there a place your mind was drawn to, to give consideration, to explore words or images? And then what is disruptive to you in that text? And when we come back, we'll have some conversation about what insights maybe you gained, what you heard that helped you in the conversation about what does this mean to make the community livable again. So, Sean? Hello! 
in my best Mrs. Doubtfire voice. <laughs> welcome, welcome back, uh, everyone. Um, love to um, have some time now to um, have some folks maybe share. Um, was there something you heard um, in the small groups that led you to a new insight, something you heard from someone else, something you want to carry forward? If you want to uh, raise your hand do it using the raised hand feature uh, within Zoom, or if you want to post it in the chats, and, or if you just want to wave uh, excessively until I get your, you know, pay attention, what, whatever works for you. I'll ask Sean and Ron to help me monitor if I'm missing something that is happening because I know that you will have profound insights that we need to hear from one another. So this is your time to share. And if you don't share, I have notes and you'll have to listen to me. So it's your choice. Anybody have some insights that you heard from another person maybe that stood out to you that you'd like to share? Yeah, I was in a group with them. Yeah. I see your name on there. Oh, it was a breakout. We have it. So I'll, be, I'll begin because I heard something in our group that was really profound. Uh, someone shared that what was disruptive about this passage was that it was asking us to relearn how to rebuild community again. And what are the expectations of what it means to rebuild community? Um, that was a wonderful insight for me to, to hear today. Anyone else? Something you heard from someone else that you want to carry forward? In the chat or raised hand. Larry, I think one of the things that uh, we talked about in our group um, and that I heard was that there's a lot of hypocrisy or, or caution against hypocrisy woven into this text in that, um, you know, we can we can act and talk. Um, and put on faces of piousness um, and yet still do harm and hurt uh, with our words and our actions, even as we're trying to be pious and, and be good disciples, the potential to do harm is there and we need to check ourselves. And so we just, we all kind of felt like there was definitely a, um, a theme of um, the, the, caution against hypocrisy sort of woven into that very first paragraph for sure. Um, but then also in the second paragraph, we definitely found that if then that you spoke of earlier in that if we do this, look at the blessings that can come. Mm. Um, for me personally, the very last sentence about making our community livable again, I just wanted to share that the in the context of the pandemic and the past 15 months we've had, um, what opportunities are there for us? What are we being invited into to make our communities livable again as we start to um, do things in person and we, as we start to come back into our physical presence with one another? Um, how do we make our communities livable again and, and in different ways than perhaps we've known in the past? Awesome. Thank you, Kim. Beautiful. Larry, we were just starting to explore the idea when our our breakout group broke up about uh, the use of the word fasting in this scripture yeah. and how in a lot of the ways it's used, it sounds more like refraining from bad behaviors as opposed yeah. to giving something up. Yeah, that was awesome. That was the first thing I thought of too, Ron, is when I think of fasting, I think of you know, suffering for Jesus and not having chicken wings for a long time, but there is nothing about that whatsoever. It's, it's, are, are you actually refraining from justice? And what does that mean? So that, that's a really good insight. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I had to work chicken wings into the conversation at some point in time, those of you that know me, so. <laughs> 
it must be scriptural in there somewhere. It is. It is. Absolutely. And you'll be carried on wings with buffalo sauce. It's in Isaiah. It's just a little bit different wording there. We're just waiting for the yoga lesson. <laughs> hey, speaking of, I have my gift right here from my friends of the Greater Pacific Northwest. A little gift they gave me of a mat rolled up right here every day. That looks a little small for you, Larry. <laughs> this is devolving in a hurry. Other insights. In our group, we talked a little bit about what Kim was talking about in that we, uh, the people in the time of Isaiah, it was obvious that they were fasting. They made it obvious. They wore black clothes. They, you know, they, they made it real clear to others what they were doing. Look at me, how good I am. Mm. We talked about how now, especially on social media, we always try to show the very best of ourselves. Mm. And that really the only place that we can be particularly vulnerable is with our church family. Wow. Beautiful. Thanks, Susan. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Reverend Lillian Daniel, who is in uh, Dubuque, Iowa. I believe she is a, a Lutheran pastor. And uh, in one of the sessions I was able to participate in with, when she was sharing, she said that justice requires more than a sense of being lucky or grateful. And um, she began to talk a little bit about this notion of Isaiah 58 and also Isaiah 61, which for our tradition has been really important because it guided some of the ideas about what it means for us in, in Zion or signal communities to be able to embrace part of the heritage that, I, that is found in Luke chapter 4, which has been critical in understanding part of our response as community of Christ. As I was thinking about this part of the conversation with Isaiah 53, 58, I also was immediately taken to the text from Micah, Micah 6, uh, verse 8. And I'm going to read the, the translation from the Inclusive Language Bible just so you can hear what Micah 6, 8 sounds like in this regard. Listen here, mortal. God has already made abundantly clear what good is and what the Holy One needs from you. Simply do justice, love kindness, and humbly walk with your God. Now, for me, the way I memorized it as a child and many years in my adult life, what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? And so this connection that Isaiah 58 and at the same time Micah, Micah 6, and what's happening there, this notion of things are totally different. So what is the most essential element that you're going to use to rebuild and find yourself a more normal place for you? And in this context, this notion of justice and equality and fairness in order that all of God's creation has its place is kind of leading me into this disruption. So I'm going to pause there now as we've had some reflection on that. So Isaiah 58, Isaiah 61, Micah 6, and Luke 4. are kind of four passages that I want to just kind of help us swim in for just a little bit while uh, you're thinking about that. And Ron will be sharing with us in our next segment. Thanks, Larry. Those are uh, actually some pretty disruptive texts. We could probably spend the rest of our time uh, just figuring out 
well, what do those really mean um, for our daily walk as a disciple? I really feel like any discussion about claiming and exercising our prophetic voice has to begin with this humble acknowledgement. I don't see things as they are, and I need the perspective of others and the impress of the Holy Spirit to help me see more clearly. I don't see things as they are, and I need the perspective of others and the impress of the Holy Spirit to help me see more clearly. This is not just a statement I'm sharing. I believe this, whether it's racism, poverty, climate change, any prophetic issue, I recognize I am always limited by my personal lens, my collective life experience. Those things influence how I see myself and how I see others and the world around me. I have found the work of Chris Argris, a Harvard University uh, professor, to be particularly helpful in understanding the way in which our minds and emotions quickly and often unconsciously process experiences to arrive at meanings and assumptions and beliefs, conclusions, and of course, actions. He developed a framework called the ladder of inference. And we're not going to spend much time with that today, but I encourage you to look this up after our session, the ladder of inference. On this ladder, we begin with our total surroundings, information that's coming in at us all the time based on our experiences, certain facts, and then details for each of us individually come into focus. We attach meaning to these facts and details based on our experiences and the culture around us. This becomes our perspective and our belief system, and we then both share and receive information through this interpretive framework in our lives. It happens all the time, and we're often not aware of it. And of course, the challenge for us personally and in dialogue with others is to get beneath the perspectives and belief systems so we can honestly examine our filters and assumptions. We may not recognize it, but we actually selectively filter out certain facts and details that do not fit our perspectives, conclusions, and beliefs. This leads to something called confirmation bias. We we tend to seek out the facts and data that support our preconceived view or perspective on a particular matter or the world. As you can imagine, it might be difficult to be open to new vision, which is at the heart of the prophetic task, if we are not willing to revisit those underlying assumptions that help form for us a perspective on how we see the world. Well, what does this mean in practice? Well, when I am thinking about how I claim and exercise my prophetic voice, I immediately, immediately have to shift my perspective from me to we, all of us. A communal experience that includes the perspective of others and the corrective lens of the Holy Spirit. In addition, I have to approach conversations less from the perspective of win, lose, or how I'm going to persuade the other person, and more from a posture of deep listening and learning. 
This is not easy. It's difficult just to listen to another person for a period of time. Try sometime to do that, to just really listen to another person without focusing on what you're going to say next. This takes a real level of self-awareness and practice, and I'm still learning how to do this. I wanna begin uh, our conversation about how we exercise our prophetic voice with a working definition of, of prophetic ministry and what author and theologian Walter Brueggemann refers to as prophetic imagination. So you may wanna to refer to a handout that I put together that we're gonna be kind of uh, working through. It's called Steps Toward Exercising our prophetic voice, steps toward exercising our prophetic voice. So I'd like to propose that the task of prophetic ministry is to cultivate and inspire the creation of an alternative lens. I don't know if you all can see me, but I've got one pair of glasses on right now. I'm going to put on another pair of glasses. I need an alternative lens that reveals the broken and unjust reality of the present and the divinely inspired possibility of God's future. I'd also like to propose that prophetic imagination is closely linked to this idea of prophetic ministry, how we cultivate and inspire the creation of this alternative lens. Prophetic ministry and prophetic imagination are how we see and speak and enact God's preferred future into being. We just read the prophetic text in Isaiah 58 of the prophet seeking to speak that alternative future into being in the lives of a community. So Walter Brueggemann has written a whole book on this topic. It's, it is a little dense. I'm going to warn you, it's not a thick book, but it's a little bit dense to read, but it's transformational in understanding our prophetic call today. It's called prophetic imagination. So if you're looking for a good book to challenge you a little bit, highly recommend it for your, for your reading. I'd also, um, I'd like to, to kind of take the concept and illustrate some steps that we could walk through to begin to exercise our prophetic voice, to claim and to exercise our prophetic voice. I want to share a brief story with you. So several years ago, I had the opportunity to make several trips to Columbia, Missouri. And you know what? I'm going to put my other glasses on because this is an old prescription. <laughs> I can't see you guys. You're all blurred. <clears throat> so I made this trip a number of years ago to um, Columbia, Missouri to engage with a prophetic 70 there named Judy Hubbard. Judy was involved in ministry to help young black men and women discover an alternative future through the establishment of a youth center in her community. She also became significantly involved in the prison system to help ensure that those who were arrested often due to drug-related crimes were getting adequate legal representation. Now, I want to share with you a little bit about how this came about. Judy served as an executive assistant to the chief of police there in Columbia, Missouri, and they were on a plane and they were traveling together to a training event. And during their event, during this plane trip, they began to talk about some of the problems in a particular part of Columbia, uh, Columbia and this particular part 
neighborhood was the Alina Boulevard neighborhood. Now, they were considering in this neighborhood actually busing kids to a totally different school that would be their own separate school because of all the problems that they were having with these young men and women. That evening, after they, they arrived at their destination and in the days that followed, the spirit disrupted Judy with thoughts about Alina Boulevard. If you hear Judy tell you this story, she'll tell you, I could not get Alina Boulevard off my mind. And I could not get these young men and women that were living in this area and their future off my mind. Now, the short version of this story is that an awakening was occurring for Judy. And through her investigation of what was going on in the Lena Boulevard neighborhood and listening to the stories in the neighborhood, she became aware of the suffering and lack of any vision or hope for the future. Now, she eventually left her job uh, as executive assistant to the police chief there. She became a full-time 70 for the church, and she opened a youth center in the Alina Boulevard area, the most, the toughest part of inner city Columbia. And that's even more amazing when you recce when you know ever met Judy. She's like about five foot three, and she's small but she's mighty. She also knew very little other than her heart yearn for an alternative future, God's future for these young men and women. And she took one faithful step at a time. She learned from the stories in that neighborhood as she talked with people. She connected with community leaders. She reflected on the insights that she was gaining and she collaborated with others in that neighborhood to envision next steps. It was a continual process of taking small little action, just one little step at a time, and then stepping back and reflecting and learning, and then envisioning the next faithful step, and then the next step after that. Judy became an outspoken advocate for the needs of young men and women in this part of the city. She spoke disruptive truth about the inequality in the prison system and schools and the neighborhood and engaged city and neighborhood leaders in prophetic conversations and actions that impacted the quality of life of the young men and women in that neighborhood. Now, her ministry eventually expanded through the establishment of uh, what was called a Mani mission there and it was devoted to helping struggling families in the area. I was with her one late afternoon when a mother with a four-year-old son called with no place to go that evening. Her boyfriend had been abusing her, physically abusing her, and she left for fear for her own safety and the safety of her son. She had a job but she just needed help finding a place to live and getting established. I remember she arrived at Amani Mission, the building there where Judy and I were that day at four o'clock in the afternoon. And Judy began to make some calls to her network of community advocates and real estate partners that she knew and had arranged for an apartment with the first 30 days rent and deposit taken care of. The apartment would actually be ready for them that evening. Now friends, I saw in the space of 60 short minutes, the empty stare and despair of a mother transformed to hope and possibility about the future. And in that space between the reality of her difficult situation and possibility of getting a fresh start in her own place with her son, 
I saw not only God's alternative future emerge, but all of us in that room, even though I don't know, we all would have named it as such, encountered the Holy Spirit lifting us that day beyond the difficult reality of her situation to the possibility of what her future could be. Now, I know that many of us pray the mission prayer, God, will you, where will your spirit lead today? Help me be fully awake. In other words, where are you inviting me to discover unresolved suffering, to listen to the voices and stories of others and dwell in that unsettling space between the reality of now and the possibility of not yet? Prophetic ministry and imagination begin with our willingness to place ourselves in the spaces that Larry was talking about, those spaces in between in our neighborhoods, towns, and cities. You know, my experience is that it rarely happens in a designated spiritual safe zone. It almost always happens in places and situations where no one expects God's future to emerge. This past year, it's happened for me in some of those places, as I've listened to the stories of those directly impacted by the dehumanizing effects of racism. And it's changed my perspective, not just my perspective, but it's changed my actions as a disciple. We begin this process of exercising our prophetic voice by asking what voices and stories am I being invited to receive? There's a practice at the end of uh, this resource that you are looking at right now called Listen to the Voices that can help you take some of those initial steps. So as we experience the suffering of others, our first step, encounter the suffering, we begin to recognize that something is not right. We begin to explore what that something is. And in that process of discovery and inner conviction and courage to speak disruptive truth emerges to draw awareness, not just to the suffering itself, but to the root causes of the suffering. And many of these issues that we're encountering today are complex and have many dimensions. This was the case with the young men and women in Columbia, Missouri. In this first step, awakening to suffering, we ask, how do I creatively expose the suffering that I've just encountered so others can experience it along with me? What are the root causes of that suffering and how do I engage in speaking disruptive truth through constructive critique? Another resource I think that can be helpful to us is Maria Simperman's Social Analysis for the 21st Century, very practical book. Chapter four helps us think through how we can engage in an analysis of root causes when we encounter suffering. This book is listed at the end of this resource. So as important as the steps of exposing suffering and then being willing to speak disruptive truth are to a changing, our collective consciousness and willingness to act, we have to move beyond protest and at some point begin to envision an alternative future. That is about claiming our prophetic voice in the world. Our next step is envisioning that alternative future. When we articulate a compelling vision that emerges from an understanding and an experience of reality and its suffering, it is energizing. Both of these things are critical. A grip on reality through informed critique 
and disruptive truth telling, but equally important is an alternative vision of what things could look like. This inspires and invites people into an alternative future. Some of you may remember the late J.C. Stewart, a former apostle in Community of Christ. He reminds us, so we live for that which ought to be. For a prophetic people, the ought is more real than the is. I think this is a really intriguing statement, and I believe it with all of my heart. This is where the Holy Spirit comes into play for us as a prophetic movement. I believe as we place ourselves in situations and relationships where we encounter suffering and study root causes something, yes, something mystical happens. As we're open to the Holy Spirit, we begin to see what we could not see before through our own interpretive lens. God's preferred future in that situation begins to emerge for us. We not only see it clearly, but a growing conviction emerges deep within us that this can be so. Not only this can be so, but this must be so. It grabs our heart and imagination, and it will not let us rest until we pursue it with everything we've got. The vision of what could be becomes more compelling and real to us than any suffering or discouragement we may be feeling in the present moment. This is how we rise above present reality to see future possibility. It's the same spirit that has energized the prophets, past and present, to speak truth and envision an alternative future. And it's the same spirit, listen to this, it's the same spirit that has infused activists with the internal fortitude to endure significant personal suffering when disrupting the status quo. In our next step, final step, living an alternative future, we take steps into that future. We literally drag the present into God's future, one step at a time. It's powerful. Those who say it can't be done better get out of the way of those who are already doing it. Jim Wallace, author, activist, pastor, and founder of Sojourner, says hope means believing in spite of the evidence and then watching the evidence change. Wow. Now, this is not pie in the sky hope, friends. This is a deep inner conviction that, in the words of the great hymn, Canticle of Turning, one of my favorite hymns, wipe away all tears, for the drawn dawn draws near and the world is about to turn. When we've done our homework in steps one through three, the Holy Spirit encourages, empowers, and infuses us with a deep-seated hope that will not let us go. This leads to a deep inner conviction that helps us make it through the setbacks and times when the evidence around us may not be supporting our hope and prophetic vision for the future at the moment. So in this step, envisioning an alternative future, we ask the following questions. What is God's preferred future in this situation? What does my exploration and conversations with other informed individuals suggest about initial steps forward? And how might I begin to articulate a compelling alternative future that speaks to the specific situation at hand? So as we move into that last step, living our alternative future, I'm inspired again by the words of J.C. Stewart. 
It is the conviction of a prophetic people that the principles by which they live will ultimately shape the human, will ultimately shape the common life of humankind. Let me say that again. It is the conviction of a prophetic people that the principles by which they live will ultimately shape the common life of humankind. In other words, when our principles and actions are grounded in God's preferred future, we create pathways, literally create pathways, um, streams in the desert, to use the words of Isaiah, pathways for peace in Christ to be relationally and culturally incarnate, words from section 163. Our willingness to live our enduring principles grounded in Christ's prophetic vision by taking steps every day to apply them in our relationships with others actually reveals a different path to follow. We stand out, but it's in a good way. And here's the thing. We have far more influence than we realize. Why? We get Look how discouraged we get sometimes by all these voices out there that are trying to divide and still fear and promote harmful ideologies and a win-lose mentality, scarcity, isolationism, and independence versus interdependence. People follow these people and these voices. Why? Because someone is telling a compel compelling narrative out there and people are following. So, hey, we've got to start speaking up. We must also tell and live a compelling prophetic vision of the future by taking steps every day to live our enduring principles and to make real the prophetic vision of Christ. So I hope you see here that there's an application to these four steps of kind of living into exercising our prophetic voice to our daily lives, just in terms of living the principles in general, but also how they apply to specific situations. I also hope that you see how important the blessings of community and unity and diversity are to the prophetic task before us. I'm here to confess, I have lost track of how many times my interpretive lens has been corrected as a result of simply listening deep listening to the story of another individual. All right, so very quickly, in this last step, living an alternative future, we're asking the following questions. What have I experienced and learned? And how is it revealing the next faithful steps? Who can I share with in my community? And that's not just my church community, but that's my interfaith community and my neighborhood as I plan and take next steps and I love this question because this is what we're all about. Who can I invite to join with me in my faith community, my interfaith community, and my neighborhood? So if you, want to, if you want to read a little bit more in depth about how you engage and mobilize others in next steps as you engage in a vision, again, chapter six in Maria Simperman's Social Analysis for the 21st Century. So as I bring this to a close, this particular session, I want to invite you just into a little prophetic imagination with me about our future as congregations and forms of Christ-centered community, what they might look like. Can you imagine a future where we gather to engage in an ongoing process of awakening to suffering, speaking disruptive truth? envisioning an alternative future and living an alternative future together? Can you imagine a weekly experience, think about this, where we bring everything we are experiencing in situations and relationships during the week into conversation, into scripture reflection, into inspired imagination, 
and action with one another. I imagine it would probably get a little bit raucous <laughs> at times, but we would be learning how to be in community together. We'd be learning how to talk about difficult issues. We'd be learning how to disagree. We'd be learning how to come to shared understandings and how to move forward all under the encouragement and prophetic imagination and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Wow, I, there is, this is at the heart of our prophetic call as a people in the world today. I just want to say before I hand things off to Larry that I know we kind of like literally flew through that last section. That's why we provided a handout. <laughs> and uh, Larry's going to be leading us through an exercise here uh, next, and we'll have also have an opportunity here toward the end for some sharing. So Larry, I think whenever you're ready, we can get started. Okay, thank you. So hopefully you have access to a handout that has been provided uh, calling uh, Reflective Practice Writing or Creating a Lament. Um, so hopefully you'll have that or Sean will place a reminder of the link in chats. I see the head nodding affirmatively. Thank you, Sean, for the nod. All those in favor of Sean's motion to nod. No, I'm sorry. Um, so make the community livable again was a phrase that kept coming back to me as I was thinking about our conversation and some presentation today. And what does it look like to make our communities livable again as we uh, see and hear the events um, that are happening all around us? In, in many ways, it feels unbearably heavy sometimes when we begin to think about um, the different aspects of what's happening in, in our world. Um, and that the reality is that we are stewards and participants with what God is doing, and it feels sometimes like that is not always happening. Uh, there are times maybe when we, if I'm going to be honest, I look around and I think, God, what are you doing? Or why aren't you doing this the way that I think it needs to be done? And in wrestling in that conversation, sometimes with God, I'm reminded that I'm not God, although my life would be easier if I were. Just saying that that would be my reality. And if you read through the Psalms, the Psalms in many ways are brutally honest with God. And uh, I've, I've noted that as we look at worship helps and things we stay away from the Psalms that call out God and the book of Lamentations in the Hebrew scriptures only appears one time in the lectionary. And I think that's because we don't know how to deal with the rawness of lament, the rawness of being honest with ourselves and the rawness of being honest with God, because in many ways we we have been conditioned by this, especially in Western Christianity. You take care of yourself and make sure you've got yourself in order. But see, the, the whole nature of lament and the psalmist's cry and of the gospel is that you worry about the neighbor, the other, the widow, the orphan, the poor, the this, the it, all of those things come together. And so we have this clash of what we pour out to God and say, God, you need to take care of this the way we want. And the reality is God says, uh, excuse me, but we need to talk about how we are addressing these issues. And so sometimes reality makes us uncomfortable. So as I was thinking about this, I, I felt like a, it would be important for us to spend some time to create maybe a lament of something that we are experiencing within our own community 
And in the handout is provided what is a fairly traditional rhythm of creating a lament. Or if you're not interested in taking and putting it in the form of words, but you feel like you want to create, maybe you want to take something like make the community livable again and begin to draw. What does that look like? Because part of the beauty of lament is it says, God, we know that you are God. Here's the situation. Here's what I'm struggling with. But we know, God, you're in the middle of this. So here's what I think we're going to do. And what does it look like? That's part of framing this notion of lament. Remember, there are many times in the Hebrew texts where God is called to action because of the prayer of the people addressing God. God responds. And so this is an opportunity for us to kind of center down and begin to think about something that is happening. Or if you're not able at this point to connect with maybe creating your own lament, but you want to be able to take a look at Isaiah 58 and then respond to what Isaiah 58 is, this is going to be a time to do that. So we're I'm going to be quiet now. Sean, I saw that. And I'm going to give you a chance on the handout if you want, or if you're on a separate piece of paper, you want to draw, you want to do a doodle, you want to begin to take some words and put them in place. And what we're going to do is we're going to invite you after a little bit of time that you've had to think about this and begin to create. We'd like to have some space for you to share your lament or creativity of images. No pressure. But those that share will inherit eternal life. No pressure. Okay, maybe not so much, but at least I thought it would get your attention. So I'm going to be quiet and give you some time to think about a situation in your neighborhood, in your city, in your village, a situation that you know about happening around you in the world, or look at Isaiah 58 and see what is called out from you there. And we're going to just have some time for you to think and create a lament. I recognize that this is a short time for you to do this work. So I'm going to just think out loud for a moment with Kim and Sean that maybe after folks have had a chance to finish up some of their work, if they would have the courage to, and also with Ashley I need to say this, if they would have the courage to submit to you their prayers, their images, those things that they could be shared through your various communications over the next weeks or whatever, as a way for people to begin to continue to live some of this conversation of prophetic imagination. So it's just an idea. So I'll, I'll leave that with <clears throat> the three of you to, to kind of help figure out what that would look like, um, in, in your communications across the mission center, no pressure. Cause I've said it to everybody to think about. So, you know, Sean, Ashley, Kim, I, yeah, is that okay? Okay. Make Looking it happen. Chat. If you look in the chat, um, what Ashley suggested is what I was going to suggest as well. Okay. As in we have the, an great. online blog. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, because I think part of the value of this is that we will continue to lean into our lament and share what that looks like so that it's not just a five-minute experience. Let's, let's learn together a little longer. So let's hear some of the creativity that is coming to this group. Any... Anyone willing to say, hey, what do we want to do? There's a question about where to send them. So Sean or Ashley or someone, I'll leave that to you to be able to respond to that. Beautiful. Susan, you want to go for it? I see you trying to get my attention. This is what I wrote for my lament. 
creator of all, I am so concerned and horrified by the events happening in Gaza and Israel. So many innocent lives are being shattered. So many are dying. God, this cannot be your will. How long will you just be an observer? My prayerful request is that your Holy Spirit touch the decision makers in such a powerful way that they cannot resist, that they will stop the hostilities and take steps to permanent peace. Lord, you have intervened before with warring nations. You empowered the women of Liberia to bring peace. Please don't wait so long this time to touch hearts and transform the warriors into literal peacemakers. Thank you, Susan. Mm. Someone else want to share either the something you created, uh, images, or if you have prayer you'd like to share. I'm happy to share. Okay. Kim and then um, is it Sh Cherry. Okay. So Kim and then Cherry. Thank you. And I'll just preface that Susan and I were on a similar um, thought process in this. Creator, who are your people? The Jews, the Palestinian, the Muslim, the Christian, Hamas. Speak, God, to all your people. Touch our hearts and eyes to see ourselves in the other, to understand that land belongs to you, creator, and all can live in peace when you are in charge, when you are the priority. Help us understand that killing one another in your name is not your desire for us, nor your will. Help us cry the tears that surely you are crying for one another. You love each of us unconditionally. Help us to do likewise. Amen. Thank you. Cherry? I think you're still on mute. There we go. Um, mine was more of a, an, a, a question um, lament. And it just said, God, what can be done in my own town and community? Where can I help? Where can I get involved? God, what needs to be done here? And do I have the rage and urgency over this? Beautiful, thank you. Awesome. Yes, Mike. How can I follow when I don't seek the path? How can I see when I don't lift my eyes? How can I respond when I fill my life with another's purpose? How can I celebrate when I live in fear of an unknown future? Wow, thank you. Wow. Yes. Uh, Diane, yes. Mine's not quite then, but I wrote, Holy God, although there are many good things occurring all around, I am disturbed at the polarization I see in my country, taking things to extreme nationalism that puts, puts us above all others, violence against others in the street, invisible people who aren't being heard, a sense of extreme dualism, black, white, right, wrong. My heart is broken by the lack of community and divisiveness. What can I do to heal my heart enough to not be judgmental of those who see things differently, to hold them as sacred? How can we begin a deeper conversation and hear each other's stories? 
Thank you. Amen. Beautiful. Yes, Pat. Just taking it kind of personally. God, I feel we are somewhat dead. We enjoy meeting together and going through the motions. I want you to shake us up. I want you to move us to see action in the community we can take. Help us see our role in creating a bit of Zion. I know you've made your will known in the past when your people have entered into a time of discernment. Help us to do that now. Amen. Thank you. Larry, we have a lot of prophets in our midst today. Amen. Amen. So I was writing these, and they're just phrases that had come to me that I need to spend time with um, unpacking, and I'm going to share them. God of disruptive grace. People long to be seen. People long to be heard. People long to be connected. People long to belong. And I too yearn for those same things. But what the heck do you want me to do? And that's where I'm done. So there's more to unpack. The thing is, people, um, God can handle this. Sometimes we're the ones that are uncomfortable. God can handle this. So as we are doing this listening, reflecting, pushing, challenging, receiving, I encourage you to, to be uh, looking to the future about what it means to respond to these opportunities. So in your writing, in your creating, in the images, those kinds of things, um, it's okay to be honest and raw and also to know that the that God and lament always looks to the future. And so we are going to be pulled into that, that future as well in whatever we create. So I hope that um, as I see the things that come out in the communication that you'll be sharing with Kim and, and Sean and Ashley, um, that there will be opportunities for us to think about what it means to lean into the future as we have looked at these particular uh, situations. So that's enough from me. Ron, what would we, what should we do now? <laughs> well, we have a few minutes left before we leave for any just general uh, observations or questions or things that you're kind of, kind of uh, maybe rumbling around in your thoughts that uh, that you might want to share either in the chat. Uh, there might be a, a word or a phrase or some something that's surfacing for you today that you want to you want to kind of keep exploring. Uh, you might want to share that with us verbally. That would be OK as well. Uh, or you might have a question uh, about something that you have heard today. I know we covered a lot of ground in a very small amount of time so um we we'd hope that we could give you some things to just kind of continue to uh direct your exploration of this really important um topic that greater pacific northwest has been exploring this year anybody have anything they'd like to As always, when we have something as special and meaningful as this time together, I wish our numbers were quadrupled. That being said, I know that everybody here has been touched and maybe that's 
all we need. Thanks, Susan. Um, these are th these conversations are conversations. Actually, I mean, we prepared obviously for this this day today, but these are conversations Larry and I have been having back and forth for quite some time uh, about what all this means and how we engage and uh, how we live up to uh, our prophetic calling in the world today. So we we have considered it a real privilege to have the opportunity to explore that a little bit with all of you today. Any I other? Th oh, go ahead, Kim. Well, I, I just want to thank you guys so much for the just the time that you've put into preparing this for us and inviting us into this conversation that's so important. Um, I'm glad to know that it's being recorded and we'll have opportunities to um, share the, the link to that recording um, with with everyone here in the Mission Center. And, and so we, yeah. we'll certainly encourage yeah. folks to get a chance to listen to it. But thank you guys so much. Yeah. And thank you all for um, coming today. Thanks, Kim. I see Mark's got his hand up. Mark? Yeah, as, as I was listening to um, both you and Larry and everyone, there are two thoughts that were coming to mind. Um, I'll go lowbrow and highbrow, I'll let you each decide which is which. Um, in the most recent Avenger movie, there was a line by um, one of the lead characters, um, and he said, as long as there are those who remember what was, there will always be those that are unable to accept what can be. They will resist it. Um, yeah, and I keep, I keep thinking there's a sermon in there somewhere. <laughs> I um, think so. Yeah. The second one I just became exposed to, and um, it's a poem, so I'm sorry, Ron, but it does rhyme. Whew, that's a relief. It, yeah. <laughs> it's by Robert Frost, and it, it was, um, he simply says, we dance around in a ring and suppose, but the secret sits in the middle hmm. and knows. And I had a pastor mm. talk to me this week in my particular um, priesthood role. And as she was talking with me, it just kept coming back to me that there are a lot of congregations that spend a lot of time doing a lot of stuff, supposing. And some time in discernment to identify the secret of the, of the, of the congregation, its purpose for existence, what God has and will for it. Um, really would be some some time well spent. Yeah, I appreciate that, Mark. And I also very much appreciate the focus that Greater Pacific Northwest has been trying to provide to that very that very point uh, with with some of their work they've been doing with helping congregations think about how to engage uh, in discernment, some of the sessions that you've had and um, I know that those are still available if some of you have not had an opportunity to uh, engage in some of those. I'm guessing you guys recorded those too. <laughs> so, um, but that's continual work occurring in this mission center to invite congregations into that very intentional work of, um, and, and this, this connects with that so deeply because we're not discerning, uh, as I said earlier today, we're not discerning in a, like whitewashed vacuum that's somehow disconnected from the pain and suffering in the world. We are discerning in the midst of that. And it's in the midst of that in-between space between the reality of the present and the possibility of the future that the spirit um, so powerfully seeks to make itself known in terms of showing us what could be uh, in our world and in those situations and relationships. And I, I truly believe if we engage in those, those kinds of journeys of discernment together, that we will discover um, that future and how we can participate in it. Thank you, Mark, for those thoughts. Well, the, uh, I'm not seeing anybody else that uh, is, is wanting to share or ask a question. Um, so the journey continues and, uh, 
we're so grateful that uh, you took time to be with us today. I'm going to actually close uh, today by sharing uh, my prayer uh, that I wrote while Larry gave us opportunity to do that, and we'll use that as uh, our sending forth. Larry, you and I were thinking along similar lines here. You'll smile when I start start this prayer. <clears throat> oh, great disruptor of the status quo. Why do the voices of those who preach division and fear seem to drown out the voices of inclusion and hope? Why does justice seem to elude those places in our world where your people call out for release? Why are those of us who claim to follow you often so slow to respond? God, break into our complacency. Disrupt our isolation with the voices of those who yearn for a different tomorrow. Help us to see what we have not been able to see, to hear what we have not been able to hear. Grant us courage to encounter the suffering to speak your disruptive truth, to envision your alternative future, and to live your alternative future in each and every day. We trust that your purposes continue to unfold. We are grateful that you continue to nudge us into the future. Amen. <clears throat>